Hey guys, this is Nick and this is your Linux, open source and privacy news fix for the first half of April. This time we have System76 working on their own desktop environment based on GNOME, Arch Linux adding a guided installer, Google winning its court case against Oracle on the use of Java in Android, and Facebook is leaking data online again. Let's take a look right after this. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is the largest independent cloud service provider, meaning they provide hosting that you can use to run your own servers, whatever you need one for. I use Linode to host my own Nextcloud instance, but thanks to their one-click apps, you can deploy any type of server in, well, in one click. If you're a gamer, you can easily start your own Valheim, Minecraft or CSGO server. But if you're looking for a VPN, you can also one-click deploy your own using WireGuard or OpenVPN and you can ensure there is no middleman trying to intercept what you're connecting to. Linode is affordable and has consistent pricing with data centers all over the globe. You can upgrade your servers in one click, just as I did on my Nextcloud instance to add more storage, and you have real humans behind it all to talk to 24-7 by phone or support ticket, even if you use the cheapest plan available, which is $5 a month, by the way. They also have very detailed documentation if you don't like talking to other human beings, which I know I'm not a fan of. If you use the link in the description to sign up, you get a $100 credit to use on your own servers, so head over there and give it a go. I am certain you won't regret it. So let's begin with the Linux news, and Elementary OS celebrated its 10th birthday. What started as a spin on GNOME 2 with the docky dock added, and a custom theme and a set of icons, has now matured into a full desktop environment, complete with its own set of applications, plenty of specific features, a dedicated app store with more than 200 specific apps in it, and more than 130 repositories on GitHub to handle all of that. Elementary OS has a laser focus on having a simple user experience and has spent the last 10 years refining their desktop, adding their own spin on various features that hadn't really changed in ages. And though some users might not find it works for them, I personally think it's one of the smoothest, most polished experience I had on any operating system, even outside of the Linux sphere. Here's hoping Elementary OS 6 comes soon. Arch Linux has added a guided installer to their ISO. As surprising a move as it is, since Arch has always been more of a learn-to-do-it-yourself distro, this installer still isn't anything like what you might be used to on more beginner-friendly distributions. It isn't a graphical installer and will just ask you a few questions in the command line interface to help you get through the process of installing Arch without having to have a second device with the wiki opened. It's also optional, as you will have to start it manually yourself if you want to use it. You can still install a full manual Arch if you prefer. The installer will let you pick your time zone, keyboard layout, partition setup, desktop environment if any, and handle encryption if you want. It can also let you pick the drivers you want to use. So basically it's a nice command line installer that should make Arch a bit easier to install without using the wiki. Elitists might be a bit disappointed though, as installing Arch won't give as much breaking rights as it once did. KDE is set to solve one of my main issues with the way apps are designed, which is the inconsistency between menu bar toting applications and hamburger menu based applications. The lengthy blog post goes in detail about why the author thinks header bars and hamburger menus, done in the GNOME style at least, aren't optimal, but also why traditional menu bars aren't that great either. They conclude by exposing a new component for KDE applications, which is a new hamburger menu that will replace the traditional menu bar when it's hidden, and I can safely say it's probably a great solution. It emulates the behavior of Dolphin, KDE's file manager, which is the following. By default, you don't see the menu bar, and a hamburger menu on the right of the window hosts the most interesting options. And you also have the ability to display the menu bar from that hamburger menu. This is, in my opinion, the best approach, as you get a clean user interface with only the most needed options in the toolbar or in the hamburger menu, and for people who need the full power of the application and every single option, the ability to display the menu bar is still there. Now you might have heard about Jing OS, the Linux distro made for tablets, with a completely adapted interface and suite of apps. It's still in development and quite bare bones and buggy, but it's promising, if not very innovative in terms of look and feel, because it's basically a copy of the iOS and Android staples. It seems that the developers might be interested to port this interface to smartphones as well. 
The team shared a video of a few apps running and some navigation running on an undisclosed smartphone and the first thing that you'll notice is that it is smooth. If you have looked at the existing efforts like Plasma Mobile or Fosh that I showed in some of my videos, you'll notice that they all seem to lack hardware acceleration, as in everything is stuttery and laggy and stays behind your fingers instead of following your movements. This could be a very interesting alternative if they can nail that side of the project. So we'll have to see how this goes as Jing OS isn't really usable on any tablet right now, so moving to smartphones might be a bit premature. System76 has been offering their own spin on Ubuntu, called Pop OS, for a few years now. Well, it seems like they're going to distance themselves more from baseline Ubuntu as they'll be working on their own desktop environment called Cosmic. Cosmic is heavily based on GNOME, but introduces some new touches here and there. The dock will be visible by default instead of being hidden behind the activities view, and this view will be splitted by two action buttons in the top bar, one to open the application grid and another one to display the opened windows and workspaces. They will also default the super key to a launcher that will let people start apps by typing their names, but also search through the whole system, execute commands or do calculations, basically like Kerunner on KDE. They will also add a lot of customization options to the dock to let people make it into a panel, auto-hide it, or put it on another screen edge than the bottom one. It's still going to be mostly GNOME, but the experience of using it will probably feel very different. These are the first steps that we'll see in action in Pop OS 20.04 that should release in June. I'd expect them to make more changes in the future and probably to change the naming scheme as well, as their tweaks to GNOME are bound to make them delay their release after Ubuntu, so using 21.04 when you're actually released in 21.06 is a bit weird. Now onto the open source news. Google won its extremely long-standing lawsuit with Oracle about the use of the Java API in Android. The courts ended up ruling in favor of Google, explaining that what they copied from the Java API was basically non-copyrightable, as it was mainly the API structure around which they redeveloped their own code to let app developers use Java as the language to create their own Android apps. It's an important ruling, as it means that for once, in the US, what is and isn't eligible to copyright has been defined. Had the courts ruled in favor of Oracle, it might have meant that a lot of operating systems would have been subject to patent trolls and lawsuits, as most of them tend to reuse some basic structures for access to Wi-Fi, Bluetooth or cell networks, for example. In the end, this lawsuit probably cost Google more than what it might have cost them in licensing Java, but the end result is a net gain for the whole tech industry, at least in the US. Europe had already ruled that APIs aren't eligible to copyright back in 2012. Google has also open sourced their Lyra codec as a beta. Lyra is an audio codec that helps making really high quality audio calls by using machine learning. It can compress raw audio down to 3 kilobits per second and still retain better quality than other codecs, at least according to Google. This codec might help ensuring that phone calls, but also video conferences, retain high quality audio and stay intelligible even in areas where cell networks or internet speeds are terrible. Now, I'm no audio expert, so maybe I'm understanding this wrong, but it seems that the net advantage of Lyra is on the encoder and decoder part, as it basically deconstructs the audio in 40 millisecond chunks, which it sends over once encoded, and the decoder then reconstructs the whole audio results based on the main features of that chunk. Now, we'll have to see what people come up with this using Lyra, as the code is already available on GitHub. Microsoft launched their own open source distribution of OpenJDK, called Microsoft Built of OpenJDK, continuing the long line of ultra-descriptive names given to Microsoft projects. It's meant to be a no-cost, long-term support distribution of OpenJDK 11 for Linux, Mac and Windows. They will backport some updates and fixes to it to ensure people can still have a good experience with this older version of Java released in 2018. Now they also plan to release a new version based on OpenJDK 17 when that's finalized. There is no real word on how this new build might be different or better than the base OpenJDK, but I guess that Microsoft must find something useful in maintaining an LTS build, maybe because they seem to use Java in some internal critical applications, notably for Azure. Now on to the gaming news and Proton 6.3-1 has been released 
and it's a huge change as it bases Proton on Wine 6.3 instead of Wine 5.13. This means that a host of new games have been added to the whitelist, like Divinity Original Sin 2, both Shenmue games, XCOM Chimera Squad, the remaster of Bioshock 2, or Company of Heroes 2. All the major libraries used by Proton have also received updates, like DXVK, which is the Direct 3D 9, 10 and 11 to Vulkan conversion layer, it's moving to version 1.8.1. VKD 3D Proton is moving to version 2.2 and F Audio to 21.03.05 and also Wine Mono is moving to 6.11. Video support has also been improved a lot, although you might see test pattern videos instead of the actual video in some cases, but at least the game won't stop working if a video tries to play and Proton can handle it. So this should basically get rid of the infamous Media Foundation tweaks that we had to apply for a lot of games, which is a very good thing. PS5 controller support is also improved, and Uplay sign-in should now work correctly. So all in all, it's a huge update, and it should make a lot more games compatible without having to resort to weird hacks like the Media Foundation hack that were needed before in a lot of games. Now, Nvidia support for X Wayland isn't far off, as they have merged their work to provide hardware-accelerated rendering for Nvidia GPUs. We'll have to wait for new driver release to enable this support fully, but it means that X Wayland should be able to talk to the NVIDIA drivers correctly, and thus play games and other hardware accelerated programs on NVIDIA-based systems. Performance should be on par with native X11, so this should finally help make Wayland a viable option for NVIDIA users, including myself. Now there might still be issues with support for Wayland proper on NVIDIA GPUs, as I don't think that all desktop environments have allowed their compositors to work with the proprietary NVIDIA driver. Now we have a few apps updates, like Getting Things Gnome, for example, which has a new big release, version 0.5. It took 9 months to birth this one, but it was worth the wait for users of GTG. First, it now supports recurring tasks, with a host of options to define the delay before the task pops up again, and emojis can be used for tag emblems, which will let people have more control over how their tags look and make them more easily identifiable. Getting things GNOME should also be a lot faster, thanks to a big performance optimization. The task editor has also been rewritten and now automatically detects subtasks and gives them a nice checkbox. It also supports subheadings written in Markdown. GTG also now has an independent dark theme and will remember the last view you opened. This new update is available through Flatpak already. Shortwave, a GTK-based web radio player, has received an update to version 2.0. The app now uses GTK4, and it's a fully responsive application that would look right whatever the window size. It also picked up a super good-looking retro mini player, it will let you receive notifications when stations or track change, and it will also let you copy the radio stream's URL, work better with keyboard navigation, and let you block hibernation or sleep while audio is playing. If you're listening to web radios, or you'd like to find audio content that you don't have to curate yourself, Shortwave seems like a pretty cool program to use. And let's conclude this video on some privacy news. The personal data of 533 million Facebook users have been leaked online including email addresses and phone numbers. It's a huge leak, covering more than 100 countries, and 30 million of those users are from the US. It includes their phone numbers, Facebook IDs, full names, locations, birth dates, bios, and in some cases, email addresses. Now, it's relatively old data, dating back to a vulnerability that has been fixed in 2019, but the most sensible data like names, birth dates, emails and phone numbers are unlikely to have changed since then. And since this data is available for free, it might be a bit more widely used by malicious actors than previous leaks. You can check if you're a part of this leak on the Have I Been Pwned website, or if you use Firefox, it should alert you automatically if you use their protections dashboard. And Google is getting sued in France for illegally tracking Android users. Max Schrems, an Austrian privacy advocate, has filed a complaint about the Android unique ad tracking ID that Google adds to literally every Android device. Much like Apple's IDFA system, it allows Google and third parties to track users' browsing behavior in order to better target them with ads. The lawsuit alleges that creating and storing these codes without the user's consent is contrary to European privacy laws. 
The same privacy advocate is already suing Google in Austria for not letting users delete this tracking identifier, so he's really going all in on the issue. And he had already won a huge court case last year about the transfer of European data to US servers where they weren't subjected to the stricter privacy laws that we have here in Europe. And that's it for this video guys, I hope you enjoyed. If you did, don't stay to like or dislike if you didn't. You can also subscribe and turn on notifications if you want to receive more videos like this one. And if you want to watch somewhere else, I'm also on Odyssey. You can check the link in the description below. Now, if you really want to help support the channel, you can join my amazing Patreon subscribers and YouTube members and get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. I thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!